In this video, we will present three aspects of the role played by the RCLC as the guardian of IHL. The first aspect relates to the RCLC preventive strategy, which consists of averting IHL violations by reminding belligerent parties of their obligations under IHL at the outset of any armed conflict or when the outbreak of hostilities appears imminent. In the case of states, such reminders generally take the form of formal memoranda addressed to governments. While it is sometimes more effective to reach armed groups through other means, including press releases, the memoranda or other forms of reminders refer to the relevant rules and principles of IHL, which are applicable to the conduct of hostilities and the protection of persons in the hands of the enemy. The second aspect of the RCRC role as the guardian of IHL relates to its action in response to IHL violations. The RCRC itself has established guidance regarding best practices for taking action following IHL violations. According to those guidelines, the preferred mode of action by the RCRC involves bilateral and confidential representations to belligerent parties. In case of violations of IHL, the RCRC will approach the belligerent party concern in confidence and makes the appropriate recommendations. Why is that such mode of action favored rather than public denunciations, which is usually the way NGOs act? It is because the RCRC must operate in a strictly neutral manner. It must remain neutral and, equally importantly, be perceived as neutral. Any suspicion of taking the side of one belligerent or any controversial position taken by the RCRC vis-à-vis -vis one belligerent is likely to obstruct its work and access to protected and suffering people. As emphasized by the RCRC itself, such policy of confidentiality is the key that enables the RCRC to open doors that would otherwise remain shut. There are indeed many examples of NGOs being prevented from doing their job after denouncing serious human rights violations. In a number of these situations, the RCRC, also aware of the violations, was able to continue having access to victims because of its confidential approach. The same reasons explain why international criminal jurisdictions such as the ICTY and the International Criminal Court have agreed not to disclose documents, information or other evidence of the RCRC and recognize the privilege of the RCRC delegates not to testify before them. However, that confidentiality is not unconditional. If the bilateral and confidential representation does not work, and violations still occur without any chance that they could cease in the near future, the RCRC may take further measures. It may first share its concerns to others, including third states, international organizations, or individuals in a position to influence the action of the recalcitrant belligerent. But it will do so provided that this it is certain that confidentiality will be not be breached. This procedure is referred to as the confidential humanitarian mobilization. And it is intended to put pressure on the belligerent party to comply with IHL. The RCRC may also publicly express its concern about the quality of its confidential bilateral di dialogue with the belligerent party or the quality of the response to its recommendations without disclosing the exact content of that dialogue or its recommendations and the responses to them. Finally, the RCRC may, as a last resort, publicly denounce IHL violations. This is, of course, 
a very difficult decision to make, which involves balancing a number of considerations. In particular, the RCRC will have to assess whether the potential positive result of its decision, the pressure put by such international denouncement on the belligerent party to stop violations, and the end of such violations, outweigh its potential negative impact. In particular, the risk of having no longer access to those suffering and of discrediting its image for order of future conflicts. In any case, according to the guidelines that the RCRC has established, such public denouncement will only be used provided that the four following conditions are met. First, the violations are major and repeated or likely to be repeated. Second, delegates have witnessed the violations with their own eyes or the existence and extent of those violations have been established on the basis of reliable and verifiable sources. Third, bilateral confidential representations and, when attempted, humanitarian mobilization efforts have failed to put an end to the violations. Fourth, such publicity is in the interest of the persons or populations affected or threatened. The third and final aspect of the RCRC role as the guardian of IHL relates to its role in reaffirming and strengthening IHL. It indeed plays an essential role in the making of IHL in different ways. It may initiate, organize or participate in consultations on the possible adoption of new IHL rules. Moreover, it may prepare or contribute to the drafting of texts intended for submission to diplomatic conference or international organization. For instance, the RCRC played a key role in the drafting and adoption of the four Geneva Conventions and the two 1977 additional protocols. The RCRC is also involved in the clarification of existing IHL, and it has produced various documents most often after a consultation process was conducted with expert and governmental delegates. Those documents include the RCRC commentaries to the four Geneva Conventions and the two additional protocols, the study on customary IHL, the Montreux document, and the interpretive guidance on the notion of direct participation in hostilities.